Hi Craig, thanks for talking to us today. To get us started, can you give us a bit of background about yourself and your experience in the security field? Hi Steve, thanks for inviting me to share my views. My background in security is incredibly holistic. I started my career with military intelligence where I gained an excellent ground in security and intelligence management. Since then I've managed security for a number of large public and private sector organisations, notably West Sussex County Council and now of course Working Links. Um, as the CISO for Working Links, I'm responsible for all areas of security. For the only organisation in the UK to have shareholders from the public, private and voluntary sectors. So as you can imagine, it's an incredibly challenging post, but, but incredibly exciting and interesting at the same time. Thanks, Craig. I look forward to getting your insights based on this experience. To get us started, let's think about the role of people in info security. It's quite easy to find articles and things that happily refer to them as the weakest link. To what extent do you feel this is true, or do users just get an undeserved bad reputation? I think it's a bit of both, Steve, to be honest. To address your first point, I think the emphasis placed on the human factor in security is certainly one that has gained much more momentum over the last decade or so. The overriding factor in any consideration of the human element is that it is ever-present and an obvious in all aspects of security. And of course, I'm not just talking about IT security. Security in general is designed to protect us as people, or something that belongs to us. To that end, the prevalence of the human within the process is inevitable. To coin a well-used phrase, whatever man makes, man can break. And this will always be the case as long as we're around. Humans are not machines and suffer from emotional pulls. This means that they are much harder to control, predict and mitigate. And subsequently, any risk posed by them is too. To come to your second point, around an undeserved reputation, I do think there is a danger that the focus of security will shift too far towards a human factor and will begin to neglect the basic principles that we've been practising for many years. This will result in us, as a profession, becoming less holistic in our approach, and I think we need to be aware of that. I think your point about the need for a holistic approach is dead right, but do you feel we're actually getting it right at present? For example, do human aspects get enough recognition and attention when compared to technology threats and controls such as malware and antivirus? And do you think that organisations understand how to approach the human aspects as readily as they do with the tech threats? In my experience, this differs greatly from one organisation to another, and is generally personality-driven. The perceived threat of security is based upon one's perception of risk as a whole and can be influenced by many different factors. Factors that affect perception can include the media, personal experience, industry best practice, etc. etc. A modern CSO needs to be a multi-skilled business professional with the ability to effectively communicate across a business and identify threats, whether they're technical or human. In general, technological threats are addressed more readily within organisations for a number of reasons. Firstly, during the early stages of a company's growth, the necessity for security generally grows out of the IT function. This ine inevitably leads to a higher prevalence being placed on IT or technology-based threats. Secondly, the industry that has grown out of the need for security software and technology, i.e. things like antivirus, have a vested interest in increasing the awareness of these threats and do so well through various marketing routes that organisations are susceptible to. In contrast, the market for human-related controls is not so easily entered, lucrative or well-developed. The third and arguably the most significant area is the ease at which the threats are addressed or controlled. The market for technological solutions is incredibly mature, meaning that solutions are easily obtainable, comparatively inexpensive and easily to implement. Essentially, they're a quick fix. Yes, I think that the tech angle is often more readily covered because of the potential to see a product-based solution and you can more readily predict and be confident that what you've invested in will do what it said. Going back to what you said about perceptions and influences, I guess one of the key things with the human-centric measures is that you're far less sure of whether and how an investment will actually pay off. Effective change within the human sphere requires a larger investment in time, money and resources and is not nearly as mature or understood, which fascinates me given how long technology has been around in comparison with us as people. This just reinforces the diversity and complexity of the human factor as a threat. I think, therefore, I've answered the second part of your earlier question. I think many organisations now have an awareness of the human factor. Whether they completely understand it or not is, is hard to say. Do you think that they generally make the effort to try? I think generally you'd have to say yes. However, in my experience, this usually depends upon the maturity of the organisation and is understandably personality driven. For example, I've worked in a number of SME type organisations that are incredibly proficient in security, normally because the CEO or MD has had experience within the area or had a bad experience in the past. 
Equally, there are just as many organisations that believe that purchasing a an antivirus programme means that they are entirely protected from risk. The prevalence of this software is readily available, making it the easy way of addressing risk. A much more mature security function starts to address the behaviours and the people and the processes as well as the technology aspects. To what extent is the human threat typically related to users who are deliberately seeking to misuse systems or cause disruption versus those that are introducing unintended inadvertent risks because they don't know any better? I think there has been a big shift in our thinking with regards to this. Historically, the focus from a security perspective was always focused on the deliberate attack by an individual intent on causing harm to an individual business. This is even more apparent in certain sectors such as the defence environment, for example. As control mechanisms have evolved and our understanding of risk has grown, we as security festivals have begun to understand that the larger risk is generally presented by a user who is acting naively or, or in error. The temptation from a security point of view is to utilise the traditional analogy of a scary would-be attacker infiltration or organisation, whether technically or physically, stealing data and then selling it on, leading to a high financial and reputational risk to the organisation. It is less easy to quantify the impact or potential impact from the accidental introduction of some malware by an untrained and unaware authorised user, and is perhaps not as easy a reference for a CEO or board member to understand. I'm a firm believer that in most organisations the inadvertent or accidental threat agent is always the most likely actor, and this should be reflected in risk models. Given that this threat is likely to be the more prominent, do you think companies generally do enough to promote awareness and understanding of security issues and the required behaviours? Basically, are the users being sufficiently equipped to play the part that's expected of them? I think this really is a mixed bag, Stephen, to be honest. Having worked in many organisations and alongside many others, the state of security awareness and training differs massively. Unfortunately, the need to increase or improve security and awareness training is normally prompted by an incident or some other form of reality check. As you can imagine, the sector within which an organisation operates has a massive effect on the way it views security and how it addresses security training. This must also be true for the security professional that operates within that sector. For example, the defence environment, to draw on a popular one, is notoriously stringent with its security controls. Its people are for the most part very security aware and operate in a such an environment on a daily basis that they need to be. Employees within the defence environment will therefore be much more accepting of security controls. For example, prohibiting of access to social media sites on work systems. The same may not be said for a high-tech company with a predominantly young workforce and an ambitious growth strategy. Within this type of environment, it is likely the user group would be extremely perturbed if they were unable to access Facebook, for example, and prohibiting it might cause a detrimental effect to the organisation, and ultimately how security is perceived within it. So how do we set about trying to position it appropriately? I think a lot of the responsibility for this falls in the lap of the security professionals. It's important that we understand the sector and environment in which we operate. It's important that we align our security strategies and controls with the risk appetite and the business goals of the organisation. If all of our security co controls are at detriment to the business objectives, we'll always be doomed to fail. OK, so with that in mind, do you have any views on the awareness and education methods that are most effective? And are the most effective ones actually the ones that are most commonly used? I believe it's incredibly important to have ambitious plans when addressing awareness and education. The objective should be to change the security culture within an organisation and not just short-term behaviours. In order to change a culture, you need to change the life behaviours of its individuals. Security awareness needs to become second nature and not a forced trait. Yes, absolutely. I think of security culture as being that point at which users think of security-related issues and implications as a natural part of their day-to-day -day activities and tasks. But that's all very well to say. How do we actually get there? Yeah, it's an interesting one, Steve. The awareness programme should be progressive, allow employees to ease into the process too quickly and you risk turning the audience off security. You must understand your audience and tailor your communications and media accordingly. Do not target a non-technical audience with technical concepts that will just not understand, for example. To get buy-in from your audience and to begin to change your culture, you cannot just concentrate on work security concerns. Make the awareness more personal, addressing home security issues. This will help to build up a trust and mutual feeling of benefit throughout the process, so things such as banking security are always a good point. You mentioned the importance of not hitting a technical audience with things they won't understand, and that strikes a note for me because one of the things I'd commonly highlight in defence of users is that the technology they're expected to use is often less than helpful in the way it's presented to them. 
In fact, this is supported by quite a lot of our research at Plymouth, which shows that users have problems understanding security-related tools and interfaces, which can be particularly worrying when they have to make decisions in terms of configuring them or responding to warnings and things like that. Do you have any views or experiences in this area? Well, I think security has to be built in from the outset of any project. In my experience, the usability of control mechanisms is often neglected in return for the effectiveness of the control. I think this has been true of all security technologies, whether IT or physical. I think that the awareness of this limitation, however, is beginning to gain momentum, and many new technologies are now taking this into consideration. The security v usability argument will always be there. However, as unfortunately it is almost impossible to make all security completely transparent to the end user. A good example is with passwords. Increase the length of a password and arguably that it will add any more security to a system. What a 14 digit password will do is completely alienate the user and force them to write it down in order to remember it. The modern security festival needs to make usability the focus of security implementations and not base controls on over egged risk levels. How much can technology be expected to do for us then? To what extent can it be used to mitigate the human threats? And is there an argument for investing more in the technology so as to limit the potential for human threats to occur? I think in short we need to strike a healthy balance between people, process and technological controls. Technology certainly can help us to reduce the risk posed by many threats and will continue to do so. This is rendered ineffective, however, if it's not backed up by good people and process controls. For example, it will always be true that there is no point encrypting a particular document to the required standard if I, as a potential intruder, can buy the originator of that document a beer in the local pub and he'll be able to tell me everything that is on it. The human factors associated with security and risk are diverse and complex, but we have to be careful that the balance is maintained. If we begin to focus too much on human elements and neglect the technology, we'll be in the same position, just in reverse. Security professionals must take it upon themselves to ensure that are rounded and holistic in their approach, addressing all aspects of risk equally and exploring controls from all areas to mitigate and minimise risk. And of course, these must stay in line with business objectives. How would an organisation be able to tell if it's got the balance right then? Do you have any tips for those that may now want to revisit their controls? Sure. I mean, it's always going to be incredibly difficult to find the right balance, and there is no definitive answer, unfortunately. The only real way to test effectiveness of controls is through really good quality metrics. For technical measures, this can be relatively straightforward. The use of logs, monitoring and benchmarking can provide good quality technical data that can then be used for the purposes of comparison. Human elements can be slightly more complicated. The ability to measure whether behaviours have changed within an organisation can prove challenging. Possible metrics include things like security awareness training results, incident report logs, etc. etc. When your metrics are showing improvement and they are real and measurable, you know you are having a positive impact. Using an external agency to test your controls can be an interesting exercise. Social engineering penetration testing is going, gaining momentum at the moment. It's a great resource in testing behaviours. Yes, although I guess the potential rider to that is that there needs to be a level of care not to alienate the staff as a consequence. I'd say this needs to be considered in the planning of the tests, and more particularly in the subsequent messaging and follow-up activities that might then need to occur. We actually have a podcast covering some of these aspects elsewhere in our collection. Absolutely. We've got to remember that staff will always need to be on our side to achieve any security aims. And actually that's a very fitting comment to bring us to the end of the session. Craig, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to talk to us. It's been really interesting getting your views and experiences on this. No problem at all, Stephen. It's been a pleasure.